Hi, it's Dwyer, the week of the fight. It's Thursday, November the 29th, 2018. Let's give some fight week thoughts on lineal champion Tyson Fury's quest to get the WBC heavyweight title from Deontay Wilder. Both fighters are unbeaten. Wilder has one of the highest knockout ratios in history in any weight class. He has stopped every man he has faced. Only one of his fights has gone the distance, and in that fight, Wilder was statistically dominant. But first remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, there is a mental health component to this fight, right? There's a mental health component. Now, what I wanna do here is to openly say that I'm not a medical doctor. I have zero. training in medicine, right? Zero. I'm going to make some statements here just to understand many of them are me speculating. But I'll say this, as with most gamblers out there, right? Most armchair gamblers who are trying to figure things out. All of us personality profile. All of us have to make decisions on how excitable a fighter is, how much in control of his or her emotions the fighter's going to be if and when the bullets start flying, right? All of us have to make these decisions just like we have to figure out, right? Just like we have to figure out which fighters are artificially enhanced or on PEDs, etc., have eaten tainted meat, etc., right? So, let's go back in boxing history, and let's look at an episode where I believe a fighter has a mental break in the ring in a championship fight, right? Now, understand, this fighter was a 7-1 to one underdog. 7-1. to one. Had he won the fight against a guy who Joe Lewis proclaimed the best heavyweight in history, had this fighter won the fight, he would have been the youngest heavyweight champion in history at that time. Right? So understand, this was the guy's first shot at the heavyweight title. His first. So as a seven to one underdog, he comes out and he has the champ confused, right? This is the dream of anyone, anyone who is competing for the heavyweight title. He has the champ baffled. The champ can't cut off the ring. The champ can't find him. This is a higher level of defense than Floyd Mayweather's. Understand with Mayweather, he's wearing body armor, right? He has his head tucked. You throw a punch, it's hitting parts of Mayweather's body, just not the right parts. You're not able to hit his chin. You're not able to catch up with him, right? No, no, this was defense where the champ, the seven to one favorite, couldn't even land. This is a young man's defense that was based on reflexes, timing, spacing, right? So, off to a fast, surprising start as a 7-1 to one underdog. Here's where boxing folklore gets a little bit hazy. People get divided, depending on who you believe. 
If you look at the tape, you'll notice the corner man leaning over the champion, Sonny Liston. Right? There are many people who believe that something was put on Liston's gloves. So then the next round starts, and the opponent, 22-year-old Cassius Clay, believes that Liston has liniment on his gloves because when Liston's gloves graze Clay's face, Clay's eyes start burning. So then in the middle of the round, in my opinion, and again, I'm just the guy in the seat at the bar next to you. In my opinion, Ali has a break. He's Cassius Clay then. Ali turns to his corner and Ali demands that his corner cut off his gloves. This is his shot at the heavyweight title. Ali, very excited that night. He's hopped up. Dare I say to these eyes, as someone who has known people who have mood swings, Ali looked manic. So he says to his trainer, and this is the importance of the trainer, a calm guy, a guy named Angelo Dundee. Ali says, cut off the gloves. Ali, in the fight, wants to quit a fight he's winning as a 7-1 to one underdog, his first shot at the heavyweight title. Ali goes further and Ali says to Dundee, look, I'm going to expose these guys. Ali is that convinced he can prove that Liston has liniment on his gloves. So it's his corner, Angelo Dundee, in between rounds, that convinces his 22-year-old fighter not to quit. Dundee, by the way, to his grave. Claim that he put his fingers on Ali's glove, then put it in his eye, and that there was clearly something illegal that was on Ali's glove. Right? Dundee believed Liston's corner was cutting corners. Right? So then Ali, his eyes clear up, goes back out there, continues to fight, convinced by his corner and is so dominant that Liston becomes the first heavyweight champion in history to lose his title sitting down on his stool. Right, The official story was that Liston hurt his shoulder and could not continue. Now here, let me offer an apology up front. I'm going to be hard on and dismissive of one of the guys in this heavyweight fight between Fury and Wilder. Right? I don't mean to be. But understand, while I believe strongly in both fighters, right? I believe both of these guys have certain traits that open eyes. Right? Wilder is one of the hardest punchers I have ever encountered in any weight class in boxing. Right? He hits Bermain Stavern right here. Stavern gets off the canvas so disoriented that Stavern says to the referee, he hit me in the back of the head. Right? Audley Harrison is completely lucid. It's the first round. The fight's in Audley Harrison's backyard. Then he gets hit and he's dropped. Harrison was an Olympic gold medalist, folks. He's dropped and he is finished. Right? I saw the Arthur Spielka fight. When Spielka hits the canvas, I was worried that Spielka was dead. That's how hard Deontay Wilder hits. I don't question his power. But what I want people to do is to understand that for me, this fight only has one real question. And that question is, which Tyson Fury 
shows up. Right? Which one? Right? Is Tyson Fury going to bring his A game? Is Tyson Fury going to bring his B game? Now let me just say this clearly. To these eyes. From this seat. If Tyson Fury brings his A game, he pitches in their shutout. 12 rounds. If it goes 12, because Fury could well end the show. If it goes 12, and if Tyson Fury is on his game, on his A game, Tyson Fury wins, in my opinion, 10 of the 12 rounds. Right? 10 of the 12 rounds. This fight will look like Bivol against Jean Pascal. Right? If Tyson Fury brings his B game, Fury has me so convinced that I would say Fury wins the fight by at least four rounds. So Tyson Fury, in my opinion, doesn't even have to be at his absolute best to win this fight by a margin. But, what if Tyson Fury comes in the ring flat? There's a world championship fighter. I'm not going to give his name because I believe in privacy. He's retired now. He's talked a little bit. He talks about entering the ring before one of the biggest fights in recent memory. And he talks about how as he was on the walk to the ring, he knew he was going to lose. He knew he was flat. Now I've long suspected that this great champion had some mental health concerns. There are certain times where you saw him and my God, the guy was brilliant. But there were other times when you saw him and he was flat. And I mean very flat. Now my point to you when it comes to boxing is it's a violent sport. Many of these guys come from very tough backgrounds. Some have been to prison. Some have been to reform school. We, the retail fan, really don't know the guy's past. Right? There's some guys today with titles who look clean cut and corporate, but who, if you dig in their past, have had problems with the law. Right? We don't talk about it enough. I'm just telling you many guys, many guys, I'm guessing more than a fifth of the sport, face mental health challenges. The best heavyweight I've ever seen in a fight, I believe, was a little bit manic at the time. Right? Go back and look at Ali against Cleveland Williams. Right? Cleveland Williams was a dangerous puncher, folks. Dangerous puncher. And Ali is so sure of himself. This is younger Ali. Right? This is Ali in the 60s. He's so sure of himself that he's carrying his hands way too low. He's not even lifting his hands for defense and he's standing practically right in front of Cleveland Williams. So what you get on film is blinding hand speed and risk taking that I'm not sure Ali himself would take if he wasn't feeling up that moment. So Tyson Fury whose A game and B game beats Deontay Wilder. Might come in the ring with far less than a B game. Far less. He might show up flat. Worse. He might be depressed. I want people to revisit the Oliver McCall Lennox Lewis rematch. Right? Keep in mind, McCall had already beaten Lennox Lewis. 
McCall has a mental break in the ring. In other words, in my opinion, without any medical training whatsoever, right? You've had multiple heavyweight title fights where guys have had breaks in the ring psychologically. There is the risk, right? You need to be aware of it. The variance is huge that Tyson Fury fighting in the United States, not his home country where he feels at home, right? No, this is on the road. This is in Deontay Wilder's country. There is the possibility that a guy who's only had two fights in the last three years, and neither of them against a great fighter, right? Safari and Pianetta, come on, right? He fights Vladimir Klitschko three years ago this month in late November of 2015. There is the possibility that the crowd is too much, that the moment is too big, that Tyson Fury's recovery, understand, he was drinking too much by his own admission, right? He was taking things. He was suspended. He was depressed. There's an interview, and it's a great interview. Dan Lebetard, I'm gonna give a journalist some pub here. He's one of the best interviewers, sports and otherwise, I've come across. He interviewed Tyson Fury this week. It was on the Dan Lebetard Highly Questionable Show on ESPN. I encourage everyone to listen to that interview. Fury openly talks about hitting the bottle. Fury openly talks about his depression. There is the possibility that Fury shows up and he's not himself on fight night. If you pick Fury to win the fight and he enters the ring, not himself, he could get blown out. The other problem with Fury, and his father has pointed this out, and it's a big problem. It's just the level of his competition. He hasn't fought anyone as good as Deontay Wilder for at least three years. Right? Vladimir Klitschko is the last world caliber elite opponent Tyson Fury has faced. So he's going to be in the ring and he's going to be shaking off rust. Understand how this fight was put together. Right? Deontay Wilder was trying to get a fight with Anthony Joshua, who is all corporate up, right? Joshua is involved with the zone and Eddie Hearn and these guys have a plan to build a platform. They're luring people like Canelo to the platform and stuff like that. So they had financial reasons not to accept a $50 million offer, even though that's a very fair offer, right? Because they needed to set up their little corporate framework. So if Joshua fights these big fights, it's on this zone corporate setup that nets them more money on the back end. Okay, we get it. But it was when Anthony Joshua was stringing along the Deontay Wilder negotiations, keeping his name in the news, kind of like every politician who's pretending to be interested in running for president of the United States in 2020 is doing right now here in the States, right? It was then that Tyson Fury stepped up and said, hey, look, man, fight me, right? This is what Vitaly Klitschko did to get a shot at Lennox Lewis, almost beat him. Right? Well, let me just say, you take the opportunities when they're presented. Right? Life doesn't run like a train station. You don't get to pick the timing. 
So Fury challenged Wilder, who accepted the challenge, because Wilder wants to be great. Right? But I need for people to understand, again, from this seat, I knew Tyson Fury was going to beat Vladimir Klitschko at least 18 months before that fight happened. Right? My pre-fight video is up here online. You might even find me talking about the fight months earlier here online as well. Fury's not a good heavyweight. He's not even a very good heavyweight. He's a historical heavyweight. When this guy's on his A game, I believe in heavyweight history, there are very few people who can be competitive with him. I know I sound like a crackpot. Not the first time. Right? My point to you is simply in terms of weight classes, right? Welterweight, middleweight, light heavyweight. You won't find a gap as big between an elite fighter and almost everyone else in the division as you will between prime fury right now and all of these big guys at heavyweight. I'm fully expecting fury to walk through Deontay Wilder. A Fury-Anthony Joshua fight is not even competitive to me. Joshua couldn't get his right hand out of the holster against Joseph Parker. How's he even going to be able to throw it against Tyson Fury who can fight left-handed? Right? Guys tethered to the pocket. Dylan White. How is White going to be able to deal with Fury's length, his ability to use length? I want you to revisit his fight against Vladimir Klitschko. Both guys, in the middle of that fight, both guys, by the fifth round of that fight, knew that Vladimir Klitschko, the then reigning heavyweight champion of several years, was way in over his head. Right? Fury's using movement. Vladimir Klitschko couldn't figure out the movement. Vladimir Klitschko couldn't get anything out of the holster. Well, let me just tell you. Had Tyson Fury, who's not relying on Ali-level reflexes and speed, this is a technician more than an athlete. Had Tyson Fury decided to collapse the pocket on Vladimir Klitschko and work inside to the body, I believe he could have done so. In other words, he beats Klitschko from the outside. He could have beaten Klitschko from the inside. Right? Understand. His jab, especially when he's from an orthodox position, is one of the best jabs in boxing. Right? The jab is one of the best jabs in boxing. His movement in this flat-footed era is simply too much for big clunky heavyweights. Now Deontay Wilder is not gonna know what to do with it. Now, I know the judges disagreed with me on these fights. But what I want the betters to do is to revisit the early rounds of Deontay Wilder against Gerald Washington. Folks, that's one-sided. I don't, I don't know what fight the judges were scoring. Those are one-sided. Deontay Wilder can't handle Gerald Washington's movement. 
right? If that pattern held, in my opinion, on my scorecard, I can only speak for my scorecard, I can't speak for the actual judges. Had that pattern held for 12 rounds, my scorecard would have had Gerald Washington winning the heavyweight title almost by shutout. Right now, Wilder catches Washington. That's what Wilder does. But let's just say, I thought Wilder looked terrible before the knockdowns, right? Before the stoppage. I thought he looked even worse against Luis Ortiz, a southpaw, working angles. It's important here because Tyson Fury can go southpaw and work angles. Now, here again, I don't know what fight the judges were watching. I thought Luis Ortiz was dominating Deontay Wilder before Wilder started knocking him down. Now, this is boxing. I'm not saying Ortiz won that fight. I'm not saying that at all. Right? You can lose every round, hit the guy, knock him out, you win the fight. Even the guy's family members will say you beat their fighter. Right? But what I am saying is, if a boxing match breaks out, Wilder doesn't have the tools to be competitive against Fury. In other words, if Fury shows up and he's mentally right, right, if he brings his A or his B game, right, if he's fit, I know he's lost a lot of weight, I'll need to see the level of fitness. Weight loss by itself isn't enough. We have a phrase in boxing where a guy's weight drained. We need to figure out whether Fury's lost the weight the right way. I'm not going to go by how guys look at press conferences. Right? But if Fury shows up and he's mentally right and his body is there, right? Because we haven't seen him really on the move a lot against Safari and Pianetta. Right? If Fury shows up and he's Tyson Fury. Deontay Wilder has no shot, in my opinion, of outboxing him. Right? Even with the judges from the Luis Ortiz fight, Deontay Wilder, without knockdowns, has no shot of beating Tyson Fury on the scorecards. Right? Now, with knockdowns, okay. You know, if, if this turns into a Manny Pacquiao, Chris Algieri fight, where one guy's getting knocked down five or six times, those add up. Right? You say, well, I thought Fury won the first round. I thought Fury won the second round. You know what? Fury getting knocked down twice in the third round, that was a 10-7 round. After three rounds, I had Wilder ahead. That's the way scoring works in boxing. I'll agree with that. But my point to you is Wilder's going to have to knock down Tyson Fury to have a chance of winning the fight. The only other way I could see Wilder having a chance is if we have a cut decision type deal as we had in the Lennox Lewis Vitaly Klitschko fight where one of the guys has a cut and they stop the fight. Right? Short of that, Fury is so dominant that he's going to walk through Deontay Wilder. Yes, I'm predicting that a guy who has fought two guys on the side of milk cartons in the last three years, who's going up against a guy who's something like 40 and 0 with 39 KOs. I'm predicting that the guy making the comeback from alcohol, drug problems, mental health depression problems, the guy who's officially the underdog in the fight. What I'm saying here in this video is that if he doesn't hit the canvas, 
he wins this fight by a cushion. He wins this fight so wide that think of the worst judges you know about. Even they won't be able to rip him off. Right now, let me say this. There are two groups of you out there. And I was personally surprised by this, and it's on film here online. I made a video early on on this fight, a few months ago. And I thought, wow, a guy coming back from <laughs> alcohol, substance abuse, mental health problems, who hasn't been fighting, you know, Joseph Parker, Anthony Joshua, uh, Dominique Brazil, right? I thought, okay, there's simply no way, no way that this guy could possibly be favored over a, an unbeaten reigning heavyweight champion with multiple defenses, right? So I was here online and I made a video and I said, look, take the underdog in this fight, take Tyson Fury. I was pointing out that Fury is ambidextrous. Fury has the better movement, the better jab. Folks, if you look at the feet, it's a complete mismatch. One guy is plotting. The other guy moves his feet, can flurry. Right? Fury had a problem with Steve Cunningham. Would, in my opinion, have a problem with Alexander Usyk. Maris Breedis, right? Slick cruiserweight guys who can move, who are elusive, who are on their toes. He's not fighting that kind of guy. He's fighting today's typical heavyweight, flat-footed, high KO percentage, trying to land a right hand on you. The fight's a mismatch. So, to my amazement, the comments started rolling in after I made that video. And people started pointing out, this was months ago, that Fury was actually the favorite in the fight. I was surprised. So I visited several sports books online. And lo and behold, at that time, the very early money. The money from gamblers, right? Gamblers will come in early, right? Then they'll also come in late, very late. It's the squares, it's the casual gamblers who come in in the middle. Well, just to understand the very early money, sniff this one out. There's no way on God's green earth that a guy could be inactive, coming back from substance abuse, alcohol abuse, admitted depression, and be favored in a fight. Unless guys have broken down the film and they realize that you're not looking at a regular heavyweight. You're likely looking at the best heavyweight of the post-Lennox Lewis era. Right? Revisit that Vladimir Klitschko fight. Think of the great heavyweights of the post Lennox Lewis era. Revisit that Vladimir Klitschko fight. Prime Vladimir Klitschko would not have come close to beating Tyson Fury. Right? Understand the Vladimir Klitschko who lost to Tyson Fury, right? was holding the title at the time. This isn't even the Vladimir Klitschko who a year after losing the title loses to Anthony Joshua. His brother Vitaly Klitschko, who I personally feel is the best heavyweight of the post Lennox Lewis era, um, I think loses to Tyson Fury. Because of Tyson Fury's jab and ring coverage, Fury also moved better than prime Vitaly Klitschko. Let's remember, Vitaly Klitschko does lose to Chris Bird in his prime. Let's remember, after a good start against Lennox Lewis, Lewis figures out, 
revisit that fight film, how to land an overhand right hand. The fight's that rough and tumble. And then Lewis, who looks like he's out of shape, who was supposed to fight Kirk Johnson and who had not prepared for Vitaly Klitschko, then starts to solve the puzzle. Right? Let's just say, when you're talking about Tyson Fury, that's the company you're talking about. The Klitschko brothers. Lennox Lewis. Great heavyweights. Right? Not heavyweights trying to prove themselves, but great heavyweights. Right? These two guys are different. Deontay Wilder, great athlete. Deontay Wilder had many coals in the fire. He was a football player. He was doing other things. He had a daughter who required medical attention. He then decided to try boxing, and he was great at it. Ends up on the U.S. Olympic team. Right now, sports is flooded with guys like this. Guys who were playing other sports who then end up in a sport that they're dominant. Right? They claim that Ken Griffey Sr. had to talk Ken Griffey Jr. into playing and focusing on baseball instead of football. Right, because Junior was a great football player. Junior didn't want to play baseball. And Dad, who was a professional baseball player, had to tell him, you play football, you'll walk with a limp. You play baseball, you can make some money. Right, Junior, I believe, had one of the highest vote totals ever for the Hall of Fame. Now, let me just say this, though. Understand, Wilder, who picks up boxing late, Picks up boxing late. He's what I call a fastball pitcher. He has a tremendous straight right hand. That's what he lives on. But he's going up against really a Floyd Mayweather type character. By that I mean a guy whose father was a fighter. Right? This is a Mikey Garcia type character. A guy who's family has been in boxing for years. So understand Fury's understanding of the game, his attention to detail, how he translates his passion, enables him, quite frankly, to see and do things that are outside of throwing a fastball, right? If you're in a baseball, Fury is Greg Maddox, right? He's Greg Maddox. Deontay Wilder is more of the relief pitcher. Craig Kimbrell, the guy who comes in and who blows you out, right? Mariano Rivera, split-fingered fastball. He does it so well. He doesn't need a lot of other pitches. Now the problem here is what happens in the wealth of rounds where Deontay Wilder is unable to land a straight right hand. Folks, I'm just predicting here that he loses 90% of them. Right? I know there are many people who say sooner or later Deontay Wilder is going to land that straight right hand. My question to you is, how many rounds? You can look this up. You don't have to answer it here. How many rounds did it take him to land that straight right hand on Arthur Spielka, whose movement shouldn't be confused with the exemplary movement of Tyson Fury? Right, folks? What I'm saying is, you're going to have a guy in there who's going to need rounds to catch up with Tyson Fury. At some point, there's going to be the recognition in this fight 
unless unless Fury's caught in the first or second round. And I will say this. Somehow Wilder has a gift of catching guys early in fights. I remember I was looking at the Audley Harrison fight and I said, Harrison just needs to stick a jab, last for a few rounds. <laughs> By the time I thought that, he was out. First round, right? Wilder, most of his KOs are early. But understand, at the championship levels, you know, now that he's fighting, guys who are a little bit more skilled. I believe there's going to come a time in this fight where a buzz starts to permeate through the arena and people start to figure out by the fifth round that Wilder needs a knockout to keep his title. Now, one of the problems Wilder's going to have is that guys who try to leap in on Tyson Fury are going to get countered with hard punches. Wilder was badly hurt by Eric Molina. If Fury hurts him like that, Fury's going to finish him. I like Tyson Fury big in this fight. I think it's a fastball pitcher against a guy who knows how to keep him from throwing that fastball. Right? Luis Ortiz, in my opinion, and I know this is not how it was scored. But in my opinion, Luis Ortiz, who had Wilder badly hurt, was winning every round. And he wasn't quite moving like I expect Tyson Fury to move in this fight. Right? Look at Fury. Think of him historically. I'll agree, he'd have a hard time against his namesake, Mike Tyson. He would have a hard time against smaller guys who can move quickly, right? Who are up on their toes. I don't believe he's going to have a hard time against a flat-footed guy whose meat and potatoes punch is a straight right hand, right? Fury can take that away by just fighting left-handed. Let me say this too. I saw Miguel Cotto and his career was waning. Right, Cotto looked like he just had a fight or two left. Then he signed on with Freddie Roach. Suddenly I'm looking at Cotto fights and Cotto is up on the balls of his feet. I thought Cotto was going to lose to Sergio Martinez, great middleweight champion. The Freddie Roach enhanced Cotto, right? Roach obviously retooled parts of his game. Was in that ring, you didn't know where he was going to be. And he was sudden. In other words, Freddie really emphasized Cotto's legs. Cotto's already a Hall of Famer when he hooks up with Roach. I'm not saying otherwise. But Roach really emphasized movement and leg work, footwork, to Cotto. So when Cotto incorporated that in his game, my God, he was devastating. Right? Sergio Martinez could not anticipate Cotto's entry point. So, I see that Freddie Roach is back with Manny Pacquiao. And I say, great. Revisit their collaboration and their big fight against Oscar De La Hoya. I think that's magic. Well, my point to you is Tyson Fury already has a decided foot speed advantage. It's decided on Deontay Wilder. The addition of Roach, just having a guy, sometimes all you need is a guy in the corner who's just going to remind you, move, <laughs> use footwork, <laughs> right? You know, get out the balls of your feet, dance this round, right? I believe Freddie Roach in Tyson Fury's corner is going to help Fury that much more. I'm expecting a dominant performance. I would not be surprised remotely 
if Fury stops Wilder late in this fight. I think the lineal beats the WBC, right? Because Vegas has this line wrong. Because the squares have outvoted the hardcore early money gamblers. You can play this simply by taking Fury to win the fight at a plus 140. He's the underdog now, folks. Hedged with Wilder by KO. In my opinion, absent knockdowns, Wilder has no chance of winning a decision. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this video. Thanks for stopping by.